in the country's history, no one had ever directly filed a case of challenging public school segregation. Marshall was on a lookout for a case outside of the Deep South where he felt NAACP lawyers had a better chance for success with open-minded judges and juries. But in the meantime, there was Clarendon County, South Carolina. The disparities between white and black resources in Clarendon County's school district number 22 were indisputable. The district served a rural community that was three-fourths black, but the county's white students had brick and mortar structures that were well-maintained grounds and modern facilities, while the black students took classes in dilapidated wooden shacks with no indoor plumbing and were forced to get their water from a community well and use outhouses no matter the weather. They had no buses and some black students had to walk up to nine miles to school. To Marshall, Clarendon County was the perfect opportunity to litigate for equal facilities, transportation, and other resources for the county's black children, but it would be foolhardy to push for full segregation. Marshall knew that he had slim odds of winning a victory in South Carolina, and he understood how dangerous a legal challenge would be for the case's plaintiffs who would bear the full brunt of white supremacy's retaliation for daring the challenge for integration. Marshall's hand was forced, however, by a surprising judge, Watts Warren. Warren was a white Charlestonian who actually supported civil rights. Warren, who was past retirement age by 1950, was ready to make one last judicial strike against America's segregated education system. Marshall arrived in Clarendon County ready to argue Briggs v. Elliott in 1950. The suit had come in the name of Lee Plaintiffs, an Army veteran, Harry Briggs, and his wife, Eliza Briggs, who was a maid at a local motel. But Warren challenged Marshall to refile the case as a direct attack on the constitutionality of segregation. The new suit would claim that separate but equal opportunities, even if materially equal, were in denial of Briggs Plaintiffs' 14th Amendment rights. Neither man was under any illusions that the case would succeed. Losing was inevitable, but Warren argued by bringing this challenge up in federal court, a loss would guarantee a hopscotch over the U.S. Court of Appeals and place him directly on the Supreme Court docket. The stakes were immense. If the MLACP were to lose his appeal before the highest court in the land, Plessy vs. Ferguson would be reaffirmed and decades of meticulous work would be lost. It may be decades more before another opportunity to challenge segregation would lead on. Marshall was conflicted but decided to push forward with Warren's plan. Briggs Yelly was now heard before a three judge panel, including Warren. On May 28, 1951, the school district's lawyer attempted to up in the trial with a surprise announcement. Clarendon counties fully acknowledged that black and white students' educational experiences were unequal. And to rectify the situation, South Carolina planned to issue a $75 million state bond to bring black students' schools up to par. Therefore, there was no need to even hear the case. Marshall was blindsided at first, but he argued that the state statement had no bearing on this litigation since the NAACP's maintained that segregation in and itself was unlawful. And the case proceeded and Marshall's team sought to demonstrate that injury inflicted upon black students by segregated education. Marshall lost Brig v. Elliott like he was expected. Two of the three judges that heard the case agreed that Clarendon County's black students received an inferior education and called the inequalities to be corrected, but held that the decision of segregated schools remain in the state. But as Judge Warren had foreseen, the loss ensured a Supreme Court appeal. Ultimately, the appeal was consolidated into four cases three years later and led to the landmark 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education case. The case originated in 1951 when the public school in Topeka, Kansas refused to enroll the daughter of a local black resident, Oliver Brown, to a school closer to her home, instead requiring her to ride a bus to a segregated black elementary school that was further away. Unlike school districts in other states involved in combined cases, Topeka in the lower case, while still requiring certain changes, found that segregated schools were substantially equal in respect to buildings, transportation, curricula, 
and the education qualifications of their teachers. Hence, the involvement of the Kansas case in the Supreme Court's findings hinged on the matter of segregation itself. Brown and 12 other local families in similar situations filed a class action lawsuit in federal court against the Topeka Board of Education, alleging that its segregation policy was unconstitutional. Then Brown's case and four other cases, including Briggs v. Elliott, all related to school segregation, first came before the Supreme Court in 1952. The court combined them into a single case under the name Brown versus the, the Board of Education of Topeka. Thurgood Marshall served as the chief's attorney for the plaintiff. Marshall fixated on school segregation case and everything else, including his home life, took a back seat. No one had to tell him this was the biggest case of his career. This case could change the face of American society as we knew it. On December 9, 1952, over 200 people stretched out in the cold white marble steps leading up to the Supreme Court. Many people were there overnight hoping to get a seat to hear the case. Marshall stated that black students in Topeka who attend segregated schools, even if the schools were equal facilities, were being denied an equal educational opportunity. The Constitution does not stop with the fact that you have equal facilities, but it covers the whole educational process. Paul E. Wilson, the Assistant District Attorney for Kansas, didn't even want to argue the case. He tried to refuse to come to Washington. It was only after the Supreme Court found that Topeka was willing to let the NAACP's case go unchallenged in the highest court that he insisted on attending. Wilson based his defense on the 1896 it's our theory that this case revolves itself simply to this, whether the separate but equal doctrine is still the law. Wilson's argument put that issue squarely on the Supreme Court. The state of Kansas, he argued, was happy to do whatever the court decided, but the court had never overturned the law of separate but equal. Over the next two days, Virginia, Delaware, and D.C. cases were argued before the Supreme Court with similar arguments. By 33 days after the cases started, all five cases had been heard and Marshall had exhausted. Marshall was exhausted and went home to New York. At first, the justices were divided on how to rule on school segregation, with Chief Justice Freddie Venison holding the opinion that Plessy v. Ferguson's verdict should stand. Then, on June 8, 1953, the Supreme Court surprised Marshall and the nation. The court issued five questions to lawyers on either side of the cases. The questions were mostly historical. For example, did the framers of the 14th Amendment intend for it to end school segregation? Did the Supreme Court have the power to abolish school segregation? And how would school integration be managed if the court were to vote to mix black and white school children? The questions were a legal puzzle, but more importantly, they were a delaying tactic. In 1952, a new president was in office, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and some members of the court felt that the Eisenhower administration needed time to deal with the decision. However, in September 1953, Judge Venison died, and Dwight D. Eisenhower replaced him with Earl Warren, who was then the governor of California. The new Chief Justice helped persuade the other justices into a unanimous decision against school segregation. In a decision issued on May 17, 1954, the court concluded that it's, a, it's opinion that declaring that segregation schools were inherently unequal and violated the Equal Protection Clause. The Equal Protection Clause is part of the first section of the 14th Amendment in the United States Constitution. The clause provides that nor shall any state deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection under its laws. It mandated that individuals in similar cases be treated equally by law and therefore segregation of public schools was unconstitutional. We conclude that it was our field in public school education and that the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs in other similar situations for whom the actions are brought are by reason of the segregated plaintiff complaining of deprived of equal protections by the laws guaranteed of the 14th Amendment. This landmark case was considered Marshall's greatest victory as a civil rights lawyer. Thank you, country boy. 
This has been One My Black History. And this was the life of Thurgood Marshall. And I'll leave you with some ideas. What do you think about Thurgood Marshall? Do you think he was a traitor? Do you feel like he was a traitor with his cooperation with the FBI? Or do you think that the ends justify the means? With that, if you like this, you love this, please consider donating to our Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. And peace.